treasure trove of information. And it reminds me that this way of being that the United States is displaying now is who we are. From the very beginning of the founding of this country as a country on land that already belonged to somebody else, yeah. using stolen labor from a different continent, we started this country with no regard for other peoples. And so the thing that gives me hope and, and strength is that also from the very beginning, there's been a weaving of resistance, yes. a weaving of understanding that this is not who we are called to be. And so we want to invite now to the stage Daniel Ellsberg, yes. who has been a significant part of that thread of resistance. Daniel is best known as the whistleblower who released the Pentagon Papers and was sentenced to 109 years in prison before his conviction was overturned. He's been an analyst at RAND Corporation and consultant to the Defense Department, specializing in problems of command and control of nuclear weapons, war plans, and crisis decision making. Do we need that? <laughs> He's working on his memoirs, America's Doomsday Machine, Confe Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. Welcome, Dan. Well, after that very informative talk on North Korea, here's, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, some reassuring words from our Secretary of State from Exxon, uh, Rex Tillerson, from Guam this morning. Um, I think Americans should sleep well at night. Have no concerns about this particular rhetoric of the last few days. In other words, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. You know, the odds of the magnificent. I'm old enough, and it's just possible there's some other people here who are old enough. I'm 86. How many people here are older than that? Okay. You may remember that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I was 14 when I heard the origins of that rhetoric we heard from uh, Trump yesterday. Fire and fury, the likes of which the world has never seen. You know. uh, actually, those words are kind of a Nazi threat. They could have come from Joseph Goebbels, but actually they didn't. Or Goering. Uh, I heard that when I was 14, as a few of you did, in a very straightforward Midwestern twang from our President Harry Truman, who, speaking after Hiroshima, was threatening a reign of ruin the likes of which the world has never seen on Japan. Interesting to know whether Trump realized here, or his speechwriter, or whoever was was echoing those exact words. And strictly speaking, that was of course a nuclear threat against, as it happens, a country that didn't have nuclear weapons. And we continued to make those threats for the next five years, really, uh, against countries that didn't have any nuclear weapons until Russia acquired some. Actually, Japan had seen fire and ruin, a reign of ruin, pretty much the same as was about to come to Nagasaki on this day 72 years ago. The firebombing of Tokyo killed 80 to 120,000 people in one night. Burned them to death with napalm, phosphorus, other facts, and proceeded to hit the next 67 Japanese cities in turn before Hiroshima. So they knew fire and ruin by that time. And I won't go into the whole story, but actually the atom bomb that was supposed to be the all-powerful weapon was neither necessary nor sufficient to end that war at that point. Had we not been willing to announce, or hinted, I should say, our willingness to keep the emperor, there's no reason to think that the next 10 atom bombs would have brought surrender. And on the other hand, if they had made that offer, as many US officials had proposed, that we were able to keep the emperor, which we wanted to do, to rule through him, the war could have been ended well before August at that time. 
So this notion that the American people have lived with ever since, of this all-powerful weapon that conveys godlike power on us, has been based essentially on a hoax ever since. But not a hoax of a willingness to kill. We've shown that already in Japan. Five years later, in North Korea, Rosie O'Donnell dropped the bomb O'Donnell, General O'Donnell, who had been on the Tokyo fire raid under General LeMay, announced as head of the Pacific Air Forces in that point that we had burned to the ground every structure of mankind in North Korea. Nothing was left standing. So they know fire and ruin. But there is a new scale, and there has been for the last 72 years, not really for 72 years, more like 62 years, I'll do, and let's see, since about 54, not 45, and what I'm referring to is this. Scientists who had been in on the beginning of the Manhattan Project, or even proposed it from the beginning, like Leo Szilard, who wrote the letter that Einstein sent to, uh, to Roosevelt, actually, in 1939. Szilard didn't want that bomb dropped on Nagasaki, not because, or Hiroshima, he didn't even want it tested at Trinity in July, not because it would kill more people than we had already been killing. It wouldn't. Oppenheimer and the others assumed that it might kill 20,000. Well, actually, it killed more than that. But not as many as at Tokyo. There was, in fact, no decision to be made of a moral kind or a political kind by Truman. The supposed agonizing, anguishing decision they made to drop the bomb was no decision at all. We'd been killing as many Japanese civilians as we could every night for five months. The Haddam bomb was no turning point on that. But it was a turning point on something else. Szilard and the others knew that what would be coming was not only atom bombs that were two or three times as powerful as Hiroshima or Nagasaki with fission bombs, but the H-bomb, super secret, was on the way for which the Nagasaki bomb, the plutonium implosion bomb that destroyed Nagasaki, would be the trigger, the necessary detonator for an H-bomb of which the first droppable bomb in 1954 was 1,000 times more powerful than Nagasaki. 15 million tons of TNT equivalent compared to 15,000 tons for Hiroshima which was compared to the roughly 15 tons of the largest blockbusters in World War II, called blockbusters because they destroyed about a city block with 15 or 20 tons of TNT. Hiroshima, 15,000. Castle Bravo test in 1954, 15 million. That was coming. So those of you, and we've all seen the pictures of Nagasaki or even more of Hiroshima after the bomb, are seeing a picture of a city that looks very much like Tokyo after the night of March 4th, 5th, 1945, five months later, pretty much the same. Victims the same, burn burns, burn burns, uh, crimes the same. But Nagasaki City, you're seeing what happens to a city when we drop the trigger to a modern thermonuclear weapon, the detonator, the detonating cap. That's that's what you're seeing. So it's a totally different a level of fire and fury in terms of scale and in terms of the fallout, in terms of the nuclear winter and everything else. Now, some of you, I'm very happy to see there are people here who were with me at Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Production Facility where they made all the plutonium triggers for our H-bombs. And keep in mind, at one point we had 37,000 nuclear weapons most of them H-bombs. Now we have about 10,000 on the shelf, uh, several thousand alert, hair trigger, about, about 4,000 operational, supposedly, of these bombs, which are, as they say, many times that of Hiroshima. With the triggers, nearly all of the current ones made at Rocky Flats. Uh, actually, I just Marion Daub just came up to me here. Wonderful to see her. When she was 17 in 1978, she and her mother stopped the train going into Rocky Flats, sitting on the tracks at night uh, with the um, uh, nuclear, uh, taking out the nuclear radioactive waste from uh, Rocky Flats, from, from without which 
taking out, they would have had to stop. And by the way, Rocky Flats eventually was closed down for its pollution of the uh, countryside forever, essentially, by a runaway grand jury that got the FBI to go in and raid it and discover what was coming on. I also see uh, Father Louis Vitale, as always, with whom I sat at the entrance to the nuclear weapons testing range at Nevada uh, for the first time. And others, uh, many others who are here. In fact, how many people here have I had the honor of being arrested with? Hey. Hey. Oh, hi, everybody. Uh, good to see you again. That's why I like days like this. And I remember at Nagasaki Day, 49, let's see, 39 years ago, 1978, uh, Nagasaki Day, we were we were sitting on the tracks and we were shutting it or we were shutting it down at the entrance. And people asked then, "Why are you doing this? You know, you don't stop." They'd ask that on the tracks. You know, you stop the arms track for a day, let's say, but you know that doesn't stop their making the bombs and so forth. And the the message was that a few of us cannot stop it, cannot stop the arms race, but the American people as a whole can and must do that. And that's what we're demanding. The threats that Trump was making the other day, the words and the music was a little different, but the sense is the same, has been the same for 70 years. First use nuclear threats by every president we've had since Harry Truman. And in the last election, uh, we had Trump saying, yes, I wouldn't take it off the table, but he was just echoing what Bush had said before him, and Obama, and Edwards, and all the other, and all the, all the Republicans that all say, not off the table, never off the table. The truth is the American people need to tell this president and Congress and the media, the U.S. has no nuclear first use option on the table. That is not an option. That is a crime against humanity. It is a preparation, a rehearsal for the destruction of life on Earth. There is no first use option. And when it comes to just making the weapons, I'm sure there are people who are there today who will see us sitting there or getting arrested, whatever, who are working there and thinking, why? We're, we're, we're doing deterrence here. We're, uh, what's the problem here? You know, we're patriots and so forth. And the answer has to be the same as at Rocky Flats. When they asked me 39 years ago on this day, why are you doing this and that, we said, there shouldn't be business as usual designing weapons, plutonium type weapons of the kind that destroyed Nagasaki and are now triggers on Nagasaki Day without having to arrest Americans to do it. You're going to do it over our bodies on this day. And that's what we're saying today. Thank you for being here.